Hi everyone, welcome to another video. In today's video I would like to talk about digital clusters and how you can install them in your car. Back in the 80s, digital clusters like these were a popular accessory. The seven segment displays and the first usage of LEDs in automotive history uh, made it look like your car came straight from the future and underlined the modernity of your, of your car back then. Nowadays, uh, these clusters are very rare and hardly sought after parts by car enthusiasts. And a lot of people like to install them. A few years ago, I did an installation of this digital cluster in my Nissan Sunny RZ1. And since then, a lot of people asked me, how did I do it? Today, I want to share my experience with it and guide you through all the necessary steps that you have to do. So especially if your car comes from Japan, you will face many obstacles when you try to install them. That's because for Japanese cars, these digital clusters are usually only available in Japan. And if you want to fit into your USDM or European spec car, you will face many obstacles. So over here, you can see the original analog cluster of the Nissan RZ1. The first step to do is to make sure it fits mechanically. That means that you can put a new cluster inside. Uh, for this car, it was straightforward because the mounting brackets over here were completely identical and I didn't have to cut anything. You might need to cut a few parts away. After you made, made sure your cluster fits mechanically into your car, you have to find out the electrical adapt uh, adaptations needed to make sure it also works electronically. If you look on the back side, you can see this digital cluster has two different types of connectors. The original cluster connections are different. So what you need to do, you need to uh, first source the connectors that fit to the digital cluster, and second, derive the pin out to be able to convert the pins from this layout to the layout used by the digital cluster. For this, a good source of information are usually the workshop manuals. I ordered a few manuals from Japan, but they also all didn't contain the necessary information. So in the end, I had to go the more difficult route and order a complete wire harness of a Japanese car. These are hard to find and in the end we were able to source one from Russia and some truck driver delivered it to me somewhere at midnight on some parking lot uh, here in Germany. We then used this entire harness and I spent several weekends on measuring out every single cable to see where it is connected to and created a diagram to be able to uh, um, locate which wire goes where. So once you have the pinout you can start modifying your car. Uh, simplest way is to chop off the old connector and solder the new one in place using the pinout that we have derived before. But what if you want to keep your car as original as possible? Say if you want at some point put the original cluster back in, then of course you don't want to chop off the connector. In this case it makes sense to build an adapter harness, one which mates up to the connector inside your car, and on the other end you have a connector which fits to your digital cluster. For this purpose you would need a connector which mates up to the original connector inside your car. So this is basically coming from your car and you would need a connector which goes on the other side, right? Since these are like special connectors that were made only for Nissan cars somewhere in the 80s, there is no connector available for the other side. So I just decided to 3D print my own one. So this is a piece of plastic which perfectly mates up with the connector. This is how the finished adapter, um, adapter harness could look like, or almost finished one. Basically these two connectors uh, line up with the, with the ones in your, in your car, and the connector up here goes to the digital cluster. Okay, now we have completed the mechanical part, the cluster fits inside. We have completed the electrical part, and most electrical connections are finished. 
if you reach the stage, you, you will find out that there's probably some things that are not perfectly adaptable. For example, if you look at the, at the speed drive, like the one which indicates a vehicle speed, on the original cluster, it's driven using a mechanical, mechanical wire. So there's basically a cable which connects your gearbox to the instrument cluster. On the speedometer cable, you have one end which connects to your car's transmission and the other end of it connects to your instrument cluster, just like this. So when your transmission rotates, this entire axle rotates, uh, drives the mechanics in here and your pointer on this cluster starts moving. For the digital cluster, the mechanism is a completely different one. For the digital cluster, somewhere in your engine bay, you have this part here. This is driven by the gear gearbox. The gearbox drives this little sensor and this sensor translates the mechanical movement into electrical signals that are then received by your cluster and your cluster will display anything. So these things are super hard to find and pretty much unobtainium. So what do you do? So if you don't have the sensors because they're really hard to find, you will need to build your own one. The first step to do so is to fully understand how these things work. All of these speed sensors usually work very similarly. They usually work by, if you rotate this pin, they will give out a defined number of electrical pulses. So if, for example, uh, per rotation they give out four pulses and your vehicle speed is so fast that this one rotates two times per second, you will have eight pulses per second. You double the speed, you have 16 pulses per second. Each sensor has slightly different characteristics. So what you can do if you find a sensor which fits mechanically onto your gearbox, you can use a microcontroller to adapt the signal to fit to the Nissan Digital Cluster. For my case, I found this sensor from an old Toyota, which perfectly mechanically matches up to the Nissan Gearbox. So the Nissan Gearbox drives the sensor, but the problem is the electric characteristics are different. So what to do? The way I solve it, I take a microprocessor to measure the frequency over here, change this frequency to the one the digital cluster expects, and then convert the signals. Let's demonstrate. I have this connector now wired up to this microprocessor over here. It will convert the frequencies, and then on the cluster you will see that it is the correct speed. Over here on my scope you see two lines. Red is the input sensor and blue is the output sensor. If I now use uh, this, this drill to simulate vehicle speed, You can see that depending on the speed, the frequencies on the scope do change. That way I'm able to replace this sensor by something which is available on the market. The next problem I faced after installing the digital cluster was the fuel reading. I realized after installing the JDM cluster into my car that the fuel readings were off. To understand this problem a bit better, let's have a look on how this fuel reading actually works. For this, I have here a fuel sensor from a standard Nissan car, like the one with analog cluster. It is mounted like this into the fuel tank, and depending on how much fuel you have in your car, this thing is either further up or further down. And depending on the position, there's a like resistive electric surface down here, so there's an electric resistance which changes depending on how high your fuel level is. This is how it works for the analog cluster. The Japanese models with digital cluster came with a different type of fuel sensor. While the basic principle was the same, instead of giving you a different resistor value, it would give you a different voltage output. To explain this a bit better, I decided to have this chart here. Yeah. On the x-axis, we have the fuel level in percent, and we have two y-axis. The one on the left side is in the unit ohm, like the, um, and represents the standard fuel sensor. The second y-axis is in volts and represents the voltage output of the fuel sensor used by the digital cluster. So now you can try to find a voltage-based fuel sensor from a Japanese model, but they are pretty much impossible to find. Alternatively, you can again use software to convert between these two fuel sensor types. How do we do this? 
First, we need to understand the characteristics of each sensor. So let's start with the standard fuel sensor. What you can do, you take the sensor, you put it onto different positions, and then for each position you record the electrical resistance you get from the sensor. So you start with an empty fuel tank and you measure the electrical resistance. You will get something like this. Then you do the next point, and you will get all the points. Then you do the next points and after a while you have completed all the characteristics. Then you do the same thing with the digital cluster. So what you do, you take a voltage, for example 5 volts, apply it to the digital cluster and see what fuel reading you get on the display. Say with 5 volts you get about 0%, no fuel displayed. Then you go down to maybe 4 volts and see what you see there and continue. That way you will get the second characteristics of the cluster. And now all you have to do is to write a little software code which has these two curves uh, programmed into its code and which translate from one curve to another. So now with these two tasks that need to be done in software, the actual fun part of engineering a proper solution started. First of all, I needed a hardware where the software can run on to, and I decided to go with a custom-made circuit board. I decided to use an STM32 microprocessor and first of all built everything up on a breadboard setup. I then simulated all the electrical circuits and all the simulation results were satisfying and the breadboard setup worked as expected. I went ahead and designed and had a custom-made PCB done. uses a socketed STM32 EVAL board which is connected to an automotive grade connector for enhanced reliability. A power supply as well as an ADC and DAC is also included on the board. Regarding the software part, you could basically hack everything together in a small Arduino sketch. Alternatively, if you are like me and like to super over-engineer software tasks, you could use a free RTOS operating system with several tasks running on it one task to convert a speed signal, one task to convert a fuel signal, and a third task for UART debugging purpose. You can connect with a UART and log out current configuration parameters, the current speed signal, the current fuel signal, and change your fuel characteristic curves on the fly. All the configuration parameters are stored in a separate flash section in the data flash, so that you can change it depending on your project. The software system also supports exception handling, so that in case during runtime something unexpected happens, this is stored in the data flash so that I can read it out later during debugging. The source code, the electrical schematics, circuit board design and CRD drawings are of course all open source and can be downloaded on my GitHub or on my website. Feel free to use them for your own project and modify them as you want to. If you're not so much into engineering and you just want to have something that works, I also plan to build a fully complete plug-and-play product, which you can just put into your Nissan Sunny, put your digital cluster on it, and it will just work. That's all for now. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please subscribe to my channel if you're interested and want to hear more progress updates on this project. Thank you and bye.